great chats. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning. Uh, my name is Ray. It's my pleasure this morning to uh, give us the Bible reading. Uh, to this morning's Bible reading comes from Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Um, so if you are looking for a Bible, if you don't have one, uh, we do have some at the back, uh, the back corner there. So they're all, that's free for you to take. Uh, Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Uh, we're going for verse 13. Uh, Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who, who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he has sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man they, who had been thrown into prison for the insurrection and murder, uh, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way into, in from the country, and put on him a, um, put put on him, and put the cross on him, and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed. Jesus turned to them and said, "Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me; weep for yourselves and for your children, for the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women." and wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nurse. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and the hills cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourselves. There was, written, there was a written notice above him, which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. For, for we are getting what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now it was the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. Thank you, Ray. Well, church, keep your Bibles open to uh, that story because we're going to be having a look at that uh, as we recount some of Jesus' last moments there as he heads toward the cross. But uh, hey, before we get there, though, I wanted to ask you about uh, what you're doing this weekend. 
you know, I hope that you, uh, as well as kind of being able to be part of our Easter celebration, be able to get out there and enjoy a bit of sunshine. Uh, maybe you're catching up on some chores, maybe you're catching up on some movies. You know, I've just had a little bit of time off and one of my favourite things is to catch up on some of those movies that you might have missed. Now, one of the things about cinema right now is that there's not actually a whole lot of variety out there. You kind of have the decision between watching one Marvel movie to watching another Marvel movie. Am I right? Is that kind of seems to be all that's in the cinemas these days? Uh, because there is something that's alluring to it, isn't there? There's something of the spectacle. Like we would love to see our superheroes going to battle uh, to save the world. And there's something that's there that we enjoy watching. Uh, but one thing that I've always noticed about these superhero movies is that they're always so, so clean, right? You know, Captain America, Mr. Clean Cut, there's lots of rubble and things blowing up, but it's never very gory. It's never, you know, there's these giant fights with aliens or whatever it is, and yet there's, it seems so clean. In fact, that's partly actually why I, I love, I love another type of epic. I, I love a different type of epic. I love the historical epic. You know, the kind of movie that is set in ancient Rome where it is uh, sandals and swords and it's dusty and it's gritty and, and, and there's all kinds of battles and, 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 and there's something about that that is, uh, for me, it's a little bit like travelling back in time. You know, I'm always struck just by the brutality of that era. It does, for us, seem like a different place, a different time, a different world. Not the kind of squeaky clean world that we have today. You see, this morning I'm going to be speaking on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But a harrowing moment 2,000 years ago that totally, completely changed the course of human history. Something that we celebrate, that we look to as Christians, we look to the cross as a sign and as a symbol of us. We see various representations all over the place. I mean, we have some here within our church, within our church logo. But the one thing about it is that it's always, as we present it today, a lot cleaner than what it might have been back in the day. You see, I didn't want to just speak about the cross and, and the reality of the crucifixion of a man without recognising actually it was bloody, that it was messy. You see, crucifixion was a system of torture and execution, probably invented by the Persians, uh, but very much used to great effect and perhaps even perfected by the Romans. See, this wasn't a method of execution used on anyone. Even the Romans recognised that this was a barbaric way to die. In fact, it was actually outlawed that no Roman citizen could be crucified. See, this wasn't, this wasn't even a system of torture reserved for even the murderers, even the thieves or the rapists. They didn't die on a cross. The crucifixion was reserved for slaves, for those that they considered less than human. It was reserved for those insurrectionists, those who would be a threat to the state those who would uh, bring uprisings. You see, the whole thing about being nailed to a cross and put on display for everyone is that everyone would know, don't be like this guy. This will happen for the one who threatens the great and mighty Roman state. You see, people considered that to be something of such disrepute, such shame, you wouldn't even talk about crucifixion. The idea that we would not only talk about crucifixion, but celebrate that in a crowd this morning with kids, women, children, all sorts, would be unheard of back in Rome. The idea that, you'd, that, that a man would be hung almost naked in agony, helpless to beat away the birds. Something of terror and of shame. See, crucifixion was a spectacle, not of a great action movie spectacle, a spectacle of terror for others to gaze upon. There was a point in time where a particular large uprising was put down by the Romans where they crucified 6,000 people. 
lined them. The, uh, those who were put down in the uprising were lined along this road. Can you imagine just for kilometres and kilometres seeing nothing else? That's a vivid example of what happens to those who oppose the Roman Empire. And yet in all of ancient history, there was one crucifixion that completely flipped the script. Yes, it's the crucifixion we're talking about this morning, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, we have four accounts of Jesus' life and his, of his death and of his crucifixion. Uh, it's such that even the most sceptical historians all agree that the facts are that Jesus Christ was crucified. But it didn't follow the script of what a crucifixion was supposed to be. So as we look at this account in Luke's gospel, that Luke the physician who followed the account, who followed Jesus' life and wrote an account for him, we're going to see how, yes, it was painful and gruesome and a horrid way to die. And yet through it, Jesus subverts everything. No one would expect that a man would triumph out of a crucifixion and become the Lord of the universe. See, read with me. Come back to, to Luke uh, 23, verse 13. Luke 23, verse 13. Luke 23, verse 13. Pilate called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I've examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he has sent him back to us, as you can see. He has therefore done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. You see, the st story here really starts with a trial scene, doesn't it? This is not an official trial. This is not the trial that's going through with judges and juries and that sort of thing. This is called a kangaroo trial. It's a kangaroo court. It's one that's designed to pervert the path of justice. See, under the dark of night, uh, these chief priests brought Jesus and laid charges against him of blasphemy. But the thing is that the Jews, according to their own law, couldn't put him to death, especially not even for blasphemy. Only the Romans could put people to death. And so knowing that the Romans could execute this man, they bring Jesus before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of the place. Now, Pilate has the authority to send Jesus to crucifixion. And yet as Pilate examines him, he says, I can find no guilt in him. Not only I, but Herod, whom I sent him off to, neither of us could find anything wrong with him. Certainly nothing worthy of crucifixion. But sadly, as justice still in our world gets, often gets perverted, here we see Jesus, he's ran through the system as they find a way to twist Pilate's arm in order to get what they want. Verse 18. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! And for the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. So in their insistence and with Pilate wanting to keep the peace and, and avoid a riot, what does he do? But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for and surrendered Jesus to their will. You see, for the first time, we see Jesus starting to flip the script here. This is not the way that things should go. You don't just get crucified for anything. Jesus, being more or less proven by the system to be innocent, is in fact sentenced to death on the charge of insurrection, which clearly Jesus had not been guilty of. And yet... A man who had been guilty of insurrection and of murder is released instead. The man known as Barabbas. Yet Jesus never protests. Did you see? Indeed, actually, as this whole scene unfolds, this is in fact 
something of Jesus' own purpose in going to the cross. See, one of Peter's closest disciples would write this about Jesus going to the cross. He said this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. On one hand, we see the pointless, unjust death of one man for another. But in another hand, we see a great exchange has taken place. An unrighteous man is put to death and an, 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 an unrighteous man is released while a righteous man is put to death. You see, in, this, in God's crazy, unfathomable planning, that's exactly the point of what's supposed to happen. We are Barabbas. We are the unrighteous. We may not be murderers and insurrectionists, but none of us can stand before the judgment seat of God and pretend that we have lived a completely righteous life. You see, I reckon in this day and age, we love to blame someone else for the problems of the world, don't we? You know, in politics, it's always, well, it's the conservatives' fault, or it's the progressives' fault, or it's the work crowd's fault. And then we look around the world and we go, oh, well, it's those dictators out there, the evil ones who invade countries. Or we say, oh, it's those kids from that bad suburb over there, they're the ones who are causing the problems. Or maybe the problems are the kids, or maybe it's their parents, or whatever it is, we can find someone else to blame, can't we? It makes us feel better about ourselves if the problems of the world aren't because of us. But no one ever thinks to look inside themselves to see that the source of all the world's problems is a, something that is common to all of humanity. In fact, the testimony of Scripture is to say that in every human heart is a broken and sinful and rebellious heart. I mean, just imagine for a moment, right? Imagine if we downloaded your whole life, everything you've ever done in public or in private, every thought, every motivation. Imagine if we could download that onto a little USB stick and play that before everyone here today. In fact, I can't think of anything more horrific than that. But it does point to something that is a truth about our hearts, isn't it? We might like to put on the gloss that we've got it all together, that we are good, that we are perfect, that we have got things under control. And yet, in truth, deep down, we know that we are all flawed, that we have all got our issues, that we have all had our failures. We would be deeply ashamed if someone truly knew what I was like. But Jesus flips the script. He doesn't blame anyone. He himself isn't guilty, and yet he, the innocent one, goes to the cross and takes the sins of the world. Martin Luther called it the great exchange, that our sins would become his, and that his righteousness would become ours, so that we could be set free. You know, when Bonnie and I got married, everything that I owned became hers, and everything that she owned became mine. Now that ended up being a pretty good deal for me because I was just a poor uh, person going into Christian ministry and she was a doctor and things worked out pretty well for me, I reckon. But I tell you, nothing compares to having my sin and my shame taken away by Christ at the great exchange. You see, my guilt, my sin, my shame is taken by Christ. He owns it now. He takes it and he takes it to the cross. See, when Jesus forgives the guilty, he doesn't do it by ignoring sin, pretending it doesn't happen. No, he deals with it at the cross. And you actually see that then illustrated in the moment of the crucifixion. Let's read on. Come with me down to verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one.
There was a written, uh, the soldiers came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Today, uh, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, church, I reckon this is an absolutely remarkable scene. You see, as these three people are held up to an excruciating execution, an expe- a spectacle, this is not what we would expect. Two criminals justly sentenced. We don't know what for, but we know that they're not innocent. They confess as much, right? You don't lie when you're at the point of death. But one of them can recognize here that strung up next to him is one who can forgive sins. And Jesus there does it. He forgives the criminal and he, and he promises paradise with him after death. Jesus, the one who even seeks forgiveness for those who would unjustly put him to death. See, who would do that? At my most painful and frustrating moments, what do I do? I lash out at others, but not Jesus. Not Jesus. Jesus offers the greatest gift known to mankind, forgiveness. For our darkest deeds, our guilt, our shame, and our death. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. But that's not all. Jesus then flips the script again. So we saw in that passage that the the Romans mocked Jesus for his claim titles. The Messiah, the Chosen One, the King of the Jews. Surely one who is so exalted and powerful, you could just save yourself. You see, surely these claims are false as we're about to execute this guy, supposed Messiah. But Jesus flips the script, don't we? He dies, but then he rises again, not just as the king of the Jews, not just as the king of the Romans, but to the right hand of God as the king of the world. Indeed, as Paul the Apostle would later write, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, the Romans believed their Caesars to be divine. Some of them were even called the son of a god. As they sat on their throne, ruling over the greatest empire of the ancient world, every knee bowed to the Caesars. Their power was the power to torture others, not to suffer. Their power was the power to execute who they like, to crucify who they like. It was, honestly, it was scandalous to hail a crucified man as divine. I mean, how is it that this crucified religious heretic could become greater than the Caesars? Now, you see, if it weren't true, well, the movement would have died out within months or years. Yet this event, this death on the cross, would spark thousands. That would inspire a movement that would go from the, the tens of thousands to the millions. You see, the irony is that within a few hundred years, the Roman Caesars themselves would bow to Jesus as Lord. That even after the Roman Empire is gone, Jesus and his followers still stand strong on this earth, in every corner of this earth. See, this guy up here, this is the first Christian emperor called Constantine. He was one who finally outlawed this barbaric act of crucifixion. He did it really out of his worship of Christ. And at that point, Christianity wasn't just a little sect anymore, it was going global. And it all started from this event, the crucifixion. You see, the Romans hoped that this spectacle would put to death any kind of uprising by the Jews. The chief priests hoped that this spectacle would put to death that this Jesus who claimed to be the Jewish Messiah, that they could put that to death. 
But the spectacle did the exact opposite, didn't it? Jesus gained millions of followers, became greater than the Caesars, the Jewish king who became the king of the world. This was a turning point in history. That all the heavens and the earth came to come and witness this event. This was a spectacle like no other. And yet Jesus triumphed over his accusers. He triumphs over sin. He triumphs over death and he triumphs over Satan. And in doing so, he sets captives free. All those who carry the verdict of guilty can be called righteous for those who put their faith and trust in him. Down this past week, I've had some holidays, so I've uh, grabbed a nice big fat book from the library. Uh, it's by uh, one of the world's actually most prominent historians. His name is Tom Holland. Now, not to be confused with Spider-Man, okay, if you're wondering, Spider, you know, Tom Holland's got a little side gig as a historian. No, Tom Holland, he's one of actually the top historians uh, in the world. He's not a Christian, but I do like him because he's an honest historian. He argues that actually human rights, belief in the equal dignity of every person, the value of the poor and the weak, the necessity of caring and advocating for the poor, all of them are values that are distinctly Christian. They didn't arise from Roman or Greek philosophy, who came before the Enlightenment. These are ideas that only arose from the belief in a universe with a single personal God who created everything and everyone, the people in his image, and belief in a saviour who came and died in sacrificial love. See, for Tom Holland, the historian, the cross of Christ is what makes Christianity unthinkable, shameful, disgusting, and at the same time, the same ticket, the same story that completely changes the course of history. So he says this, it's the audacity of it, the audacity of finding in a twisted and defeated corpse the glory of the creator of the universe. That serves to explain more surely than anything else the sheer strangeness of Christianity and of the civilization to which it gave birth. You can see what he's saying, isn't it? This is a strange event. This is not the way things go. This is not the way crucifixion goes. And yet as it plays out, the audacity that we would believe that strung up on that cross was the Son of God, the one who is exchanged for your sin and mine. It's audacious. It's bold. It's, it's no story that any human could possibly have written. But you know what? I reckon this is not just about the historians who acknowledge the power of this story of a crucified saviour. You know, this is a story for me and for you. You know, in my life, I've always wondered whether I'm worthy of, of being loved. You know, I'm, not, I'm someone who lives with a bit of imposter syndrome, you know? I don't know if you ever feel imposter syndrome where you, you wonder, well, if, if people really knew what I was like, would they love me? Would they reject me? Yet when I encounter this story of a risen saviour, I see a God who knows me inside and out, who does know my flaws, my failures, my addictions, and he comes down to earth and he would face false accusation and the most painful and humiliating death that anyone can experience and do it out of love for me and for you. See, dear friends, that is the power of the great exchange. Jesus taking the sins of the world. That is the saviour we celebrate today. That is the saviour who brings forgiveness and eternal life. Now just read with me to the end of the story. Verse 44. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. You can see at this moment, there stands a centurion, someone who's probably witnessed hundreds, if not thousands, of crucifixions. But he stands there and he says, and he sees, and he praises God for it, that surely this was the righteous one. There. Nailed to a cross. 
someone who has no right to understand that at that moment. See, church, who do you see on that cross? Who do you see now to that cross? You know, our hope and aim here at CP is that everyone who would see that man would recognize that he was the one nailed on the cross for you and for me. The Son of God who dies in our place to set us free. And you know, maybe Easter, this Easter is a moment for you to consider whether you need to follow this man. Whether he is who he says he is. The righteous in place of us, the unrighteous. Maybe this is not just a turning point in human history, but the turning point in your history. You see, this weekend is a moment for us to celebrate. It's a a weekend to proclaim, though, that here we have the crucified one, crucified for us. Now, in a moment, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to take in communion together. And communion is a way for us to actually remember, acknowledge and celebrate that moment together. But let me pray for us before we do that so that we can get our minds and our hearts in a place to be able to remember this Jesus died for us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do want to thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his death. We thank you that the innocent one took the place of the guilty like us. Father, he has set us free. He is the only one who can forgive. Lord, he is the only one who can can offer life because he has forgiven our sin. And Father, I do pray for us, for those of us who have not yet made that decision to follow him. Father, might you give them opportunity to explore this further. Might you bring them to the point of recognising that this man indeed was the righteous one in place of the unrighteous. And Father, we pray that we would celebrate him and remember him this weekend and acknowledge him as who he is, the King of the Jews, the King of the world, the Son of God and the Messiah. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.